Well, I'm excited to share with you a 35 acre makeover uh, parcel that I had recently in Wisconsin. And really, I want you to look at it doesn't really matter what state this is in because the concepts apply everywhere. The concepts of access, how deer relate to each other, the depth of cover that we talk about. And I'm going to look at, you know, this is obviously before. And I'll just talk about it very briefly. And then we'll look at what this looks like after and what the client's going to implement this year. I'm excited because this is an actual traditional big buck area. It's a very good area to hunt. And there's so much potential that the landowner's not even close to realizing any of the potential. So I'll talk with landowners a lot and say, you know, for this land, looking at your, you know, what's exciting, I'll tell the landowner is that you guys are at a one or two out of your potential of 10 out of 10. So you have a long ways to go to get and appreciate your full level potential, but you have a long ways to go. You're going to notice huge changes every year until you max out at year four or five to gain your full potential. But that's exciting because along the way, there's so much can be done. And a lot of that can be done that first year, you know, and that's changing access, changing how it's hunted. And so let's talk about this really quick. And so I'm hoping you can, you can apply some of these concepts to your own land. And it doesn't matter if it's a 500 acre parcel or a five acre parcel, in this case, 35, the concepts again are still the same. They're still the same. People say, can you do a property drawing on uh, and, uh, and design on a 40 acre parcel and show us? Cause that's what I have or 80 acre. That's what I have or a 200 acre. Folks, it's all the same concepts. You gotta develop the core. You gotta build the most contiguous area in your land of sanctuary that includes your food plots so that deer feel safe and can't see you, hear you, or smell you in those areas until you shoot them, until you have to go track a deer, which we, I advise to after dark. But bottom line is, you have to be able to hunt your land. And the way this is being hunted right now, red are stands. This black area is some woods or some woods here, woods around the neighbor's house. And this is currently an ag right here. And then ag all the way through here, and there's a center ridge. It goes, this is a high point all the way through this area. So it's all ag. There's a big shooting house right here, out in the middle of the ag field. And it's right before the ridge line, so it's pretty decent access. It's kind of cool. So the bottom line is, though, you can't get into here. And then you have people that are also going. There's sometimes two or three people that hunt here. They're walking through the ag right next to this blind to hunt this location or hunt this location. One of the main hunting spots is this location. And as you can guess why, with low woods, it's kind of open. There's a mix of spruce and fir, some birch. There's really not much going on in there. The edge is where there's some decent timber as far as aspen regeneration, some soft maple, and even some oak up in this corner. But bottom line is it's all open and there's nowhere for deer to bed because you can get down in the winter time like we were looking with snow on the ground. You can see 100 yards through this low swamp cover because there's no branches lower and you can look under it and you can stand here and look over to see this little mound where the where the blind is in the back so kind of imagine if people are coming in here to hunt going there what are all the deer doing they're leaving the property they're going north they're going west because this is open fields across the road this is open fields across this road so by and large when they're attacking here the deer are going up here and so the best stands are this one this one they're waiting for deer to come back onto the property. That's what I call it outside in property, meaning you're waiting for deer to come from the outside to go into your property instead of holding deer on your own property and releasing them after dark. It becomes very difficult to hunt and for that they're not seeing a lot, of, a lot of bucks in the property, let alone a lot of does. So they're really not seeing a lot of deer because every time they walk on the property they're spooking deer and there's nowhere for those deer to hold. They can't access this stand without spooking every deer in the ag field that's out there, even if it's cut corn. And if it's standing corn, the deer will hold for some period of time. But even then, once they walk through that cornfield to get to this stand, get to this stand, they blow their scent into those areas. There's no control of scent. Then it just creates a disaster for no matter what they do, no matter how good this food plot is up in the corner, which is only about a half acre, no matter how good of a job they do with a food plot, even if they wanted to manage their scent, in that stand right there, where can you sit and blow your scent? You can't blow it to the ag because deer might be there can't blow it to the woods because you can blow that whole small area of woods out eight to ten acres whatever it is and it's gone so that was the current way that it is now there's a lot of concepts that can be applied to this so once you look at this I'm gonna erase this and then I'm going to change that so that you can see what this looks like afterwards and compare 
between the two. So whether you want to take a screenshot of this, a screenshot later, you can look at the two side by side, but there's a way that this could be improved to make sure that they can realize the potential of this land very quickly. And I'm always excited when I look at a property like this because there's so many different strategies they can apply and concepts that'll change their hunt this season. They don't have to wait. They just have to wait for a few months more, do it the right way and they'll have a great hunt and start to experience a great herd and the ability to be an actual true herd influencer in the entire area. I will mention they're baiting back here, they're baiting by this stand and you can start to see the problem even with the bait. You're getting into the stand and it's actually legal to do in this area, but they're getting in and out. The deer, every deer can watch them where they're baiting. Every stand that they used a lot, there's a bait pile by. And so it's pretty easy to spook those deer because they can't get in and out of the stands without spooking deer. No scent management, no good access. So let's change this and flip it around and, and we'll show you what it looks like. And uh, again, I'm excited for this landowner because there's so much they can do right now. And, and the cool thing is I tell a lot of clients is you have no idea the potential you have because you've never seen it. I've seen it, Dylan's seen it, we've all seen it where people make great changes on their property and very quickly they turn their season around, they're excited, they tell us about it, and most of all they have a lot of fun and it keeps them in the game a lot longer, keeps them hunting a lot longer because they get fired up and that's why we have this channel. So I want you guys to be fired up at the changes you can make in your own hunt, your own land, whether it's on public land, private land, where you hunt, there's changes that can be made right now to ensure that you have a great hunt and change things so you're not doing the same old thing over and over again and change things for this season. So let's flip this around and see what it looks like after. Took a little bit of walk, drew it up, and talked to the clients on that snowy, very, very cold winter day. Hey, you guys, we'll get back to the video really quick, but we are having our Camp Kicking Bear June 11th charity event again this year. It's $300 times 50 people for the Habitat portion. We're gonna have a $100 hunt giveaway. Bottom line is, here are the details right here. Again, June 11th, mark it on your calendar. You can pre-register by emailing the site. We'll have more details to follow, but I can't wait to meet you if you come to the event. Every dime we raise goes to Camp Kicking Bear. It's a great cause. Now back to today's video. Now part of the problem with that, that first property design, when you just look at it the way it was, the way it was been hunted, is there's really no one the area, area on the property that was a sanctuary. And a sanctuary, the most important, like I talk about all the time, the most important portion of your sanctuary is actually your food source. Because if deer are not hitting your food source until well after dark, then they're not on your property anywhere near your property during the daylight. They're not focusing on your land during the daylight. And that can happen on an eight acre piece of property, 800, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is there was zero property efficiency. And we'll add that to the list too, but land efficiency is Something I talk about all the time. What percentage of your land can deer not see you, hear you, or smell you? And that's that portion that X out of X acres gives you your land percent, your land efficiency total. You should have at least 50% of your land that deer shouldn't see you or hear you or smell you when you actually hunt. And you look at this area and you can see the, uh, the red dots here. I'm really going to mess this up here. So, um, you know, I apologize for that. It's going to look kind of messy by the time we're all done with it. But this is something I'll show on a on a uh, presentation with a client where I actually I could actually draw on the tablet and I could add these lines and subtract them, so it looks a lot cleaner. And I've showed you the HuntWise drawing that I had on there as far as used a HuntWise screenshot of an aerial photo and then draw out the plan. That looks a lot neater, obviously. But this is that area. I'm just going to draw a heavy black line around it that deer can't see here or shouldn't see here or smell the clients during the hunting season unless they're tracking a deer. And if you look at this, the outline of the 35 acres goes around the neighbor, they have five acres, and then the 35 acres right here. I would say there's about 18 to 20 acres out of the 35, maybe 22, that are all deer all the time. What I mean by that is the food plots, the bedding areas we talk about, and I'll talk about in a second how they were created, it's all deer all the time. They're not walking through it, you know, gone are the stands along this wood line. It's not gonna work. Gone walking to a blind this way through the woods or one up into here. You have to have that area. So what we're talking about is depth of cover. What I mean by that is here's the food, which is brought towards the front of the property, and then they have this area right here where they can actually hold deer. That's very critical. Because of that depth of cover, and because there's areas where you can have improved bedding, then 
in this area here deer are drawn to that food they can use that food during the daylight and then they can go back now we're not going to put food down by the road or by this road over here the really cool thing is with that ridge system sometimes you know the lay of the land dictates what you do but that food can be centralized with big food and then it's all tipped in on that field they're getting rid of the ag because the ag isn't helping them in any way it's a huge hindrance to their overall goals to have a good herd and a good hunt get rid of the ag and and that's what they're doing so on the inside tipped forward is where we put the food so it's not exposed to either road on either side and certainly the access even getting to a blind right there we have a little little deer trail between these two right here so that deer trail is through switchgrass you can see all this white area is all switch that's so that the clients can actually insulate the deer movements and get in and out typically deer do not bed in switch because they're missing two feedings a day there's no browse and thick secure cover like that that's a base form of bedding cover without the addition of browse hardwood regeneration briars early successional growth pollinator blends whatever it is the deer don't have anything to feed on so they'd rather bed on this side of the food plots because all these blue areas right here that we can hide within valleys there's a big valley right here our areas we can actually hold does and fawns especially out towards that food source during the daylight hours because they're going to be pockets of switch early succession of growth they're going to plant a mix of shrubs briars and various trees so that those type of areas can start to offer what deer need during their bedding hours so they can have the base of the cover the base bedding cover of the switch and then right next door meaning 10 feet away they can have that browse so these blue areas and the area is shaded with splotches you can see those yellow uh, pockets of switchgrass in there and then the brown surrounding them those are those areas that can actually hold deer so for that we're creating bedding layers what i mean by that is those does and fawns like to bed out close to that food they want to bed within 50 to 100 yards that means by the time we get back into here and we'll talk about what we're going to do with the woods then you can start to have some buck bedding and if those bucks are bedding and you're not spooking them they can be just outside your property if the neighbor pushes them if they want that afternoon food source we find that they just compact in closer to that food source in the afternoon they just cheat towards the side of the food plot they don't leave all together because the afternoon food source that they hit right around shooting hours a little bit before a little after often determined on the weather and the time of year is their most priority of the entire day that's what dictates their five feedings that sets the clock for their five feedings that's their big feeding that's their dinner time and so that's a priority the does and fawns we expect to bed out here and by the time you start getting into the woods that's mostly bucks most of the time unless the does and fawns are spooked and if the does and fawns are spooked out of here we failed with a habitat design because if the does and fawns are running into here those bucks are leaving it's a pinball effect so we need to have that switch grass on the outside to fully insulate the client's approach from their camper and they're fortunate they have these roads because they can walk all the way around and slip in because the food's out here it's giving them am and pm stands what i mean by that is by the time they get back here they're waiting for those deer to come back to them in the morning when they're hunting on the edges of food or food goes in and out or in the in the stand right here maybe over here they're waiting for deer to come out to those plots and feed and the majority of those stands are bow and gun even this permanent stand right here from the air you can see that it's actually a white dot and in that case they're waiting for the deer to go back and forth through the food but they can just simply slip out through tall switch go right into the neighbor's yard and get out of there so that neighbor actually offers a bumper of no deer activity during the day which helps them to access in and out blow their scent into that location so really good setup for getting on and off the parcel right there very thick with switch grass all the way around and the real deer stuff starts in here especially in that black line around here i don't want them to prove anything with the woods i want it to be open mature wood so that they can use it for access and not expect deer to be right at their feet or bedding in that location that they're actually walking through before daylight to get in to morning stands we have morning stands towards the back and bedding areas with multiple winds and then we have evening stands out front that relate to food or going to food coming from food also deer trails you can't see on here deer trail extending into the edge of the woods into the the major portion of the bedding back here in the woods and another deer trail that they're cutting in here that could be just a dr brush trimmer with 30 inches wide chainsaw you don't want to make it too thick too constricting 
but just simply a deer trail that goes in the woods and that's what you're going to pinpoint your hunting that's what you're going to put a mock scrape over at each stand location so that you'd further define that use in a dry parcel you'd add a water hole you could put a couple water holes in the location like this stand like that you can even have a water hole back here and one back here so the opposite ends of the woods different deer movements to complement that we end up creating because you have a stand see these stands around here they're all they might have run into some of those with a red line but I'll draw out these stands again like this. So you have multiple stands for multiple winds. That means on a southwest wind day, you could actually have three people hunting up here. On a northwest wind day, you could have four people hunting or three to four people hunting. Easterly winds and northeast wind, you can have three stands. Southeast winds, you have three stands. I think you get the picture where you have multiple winds, multiple stand locations for those winds, and you don't ever have to really take a chance on spooking deer. It's kind of a cool thing because let's say you get southeast winds. We get a lot of southeast winds in Wisconsin. South, southeast, south, southwest, that's a stable wind. That's the 35% wind that we get. All the other wind directions, north, west, east, share those. Every time it rains, we get east on the front side. Every time there's a front coming through, you get east winds on the front side. A lot of people don't realize you're even getting east winds because they're the light winds. Northwest wind is not the predominant wind just about anywhere in the entire country. Um, don't believe that. You can just look at the weather history. Pull up October, November for your area. Uh, weather underground is one, th one source we use for historical weather patterns. It's pretty easy to see. You'll see those percentages I'm talking about. So this stand, you're blowing your scent back into the house. This stand, you're blowing into the woods or into the road, this stand you're blown into open mature hardwoods that haven't been touched on the neighbors. Same with up here. Here you're blowing it towards swampy area. Here you're blowing it towards the road. So your downwind is protected. You don't want to set up those stands so that downwind you're putting a bedding area or food source. All season food and cover. What we're doing with the bedding in here is we're cutting down the random maple and where we find concentrations of maple, birch, even an occasional aspen, some ash right now that can be cut down before it's destroyed and killed. You're pocket cutting the conifer around there, and I'm talking pockets of 30, 40, 50 feet wide, small areas, a 20th of an acre, 10th of an acre, quarter acre, eighth of an acre at the most, not a quarter acre, not a half acre, so that you can actually get sunlight into those areas, regeneration, you're putting that timber on the ground, and they're small enough that you're not blocking movement. If deer wanna bed around them, they can do that, but they're, you're creating a lot of brows and you're creating a visual so that when you're down looking under that canopy, you want to go every 30, 40 yards, you're creating another pocket based on the percentage of hardwood that's in that spot for regeneration in the future so that you can't see past that. Now you're breaking up the woods. When the deer go in there, it soaks them up like a sponge. It's not one big open movement, so they're just running off to the neighbor's land. It actually holds them and gives them bedding opportunity as opposed to the other way around. So we're creating all season cover. Now you have hardwood regeneration. You have woody shrub growth and herbaceous growth, weeds, briars growing out in the fields on this side of the food plots, out here in these blue areas, opportunity for bedding, and then you have switchgrass where you don't want the deer to bed. So we're creating a very deep and broad amount of bedding on the property that wasn't already there. Again, we're taking this, the efficiency of the property up to a 60, 65% range where you have around 20 acres, 22 out of 35 that are all deer all the time as opposed to zero. There were no areas on the property where deer could hold and say, I'm never going to see a hunter, smell them or see them, hear them. Number six, sanctuary. Again, there wasn't, if it's deer can see you, hear you or smell you, it's not a sanctuary. Now you, that's, there's actually true sanctuary on the property. Again, that sanctuary encompasses the food plots too. That is the most important portion of your food plot, of your uh, property. If there's deer hitting your food plots, by and large, after dark, well after dark, that means they're nowhere near your property during the daylight. So I want to hammer that home. It's very critical. Number seven, the land percentage. Again, I talked about that percentage, that percentage of efficiency. So we're put, going to put all season food in here. They want 50% in corn, which is perfect. I mean, that's what I recommended. So they're gonna go with that 50% in corn and they're gonna have brassicas. And then they're gonna go with a green blend. I recommend 100 pounds of peas per acre, 50 pounds of beans. These are planted at the same time of the brassica around August 1st in this location. And then uh, five pounds of tillage radish, and then they can follow up with about 100 pounds of rye per acre, 200 pounds of rye per acre around Labor Day, depending on how much open soil is exposed. If you have 40, 50% soil exposed because the deer are hammering it, add 200, 250 pounds. 
If you see a minimal amount of soil exposed at 100 pounds of rye per acre, wheat in a pinch is the same thing, but oats is completely different because oats will be brown in November in this area, mid-November, even cold hardy oats will be browned and that's not a good idea. So this is a before and after of that property. And like I said before, there's so much potential because the clients weren't doing any of this. They weren't controlling scent, controlling access. They didn't create all season bedding cover or all season bedding food or, or food. And so there really wasn't a recipe where they're going to experience success in any way. In fact, it might even been one out of 10 with potential if in fact it could have been zero out of a 10 because they're not even getting close to what it will be. And they knew that, that's why they hired us. Not, a, not trying to cut the, this, these clients down and the little party of hunters that were there it's just that's the way it was for a very long time. We look at something like this. We had a couple hour conversation in the morning. Went out and looked at the property for a couple hours, three hours. Pretty easy to scour over this, especially when we've talked about it at length from the air at breakfast time and meeting. That's what the bulk of breakfast is. People want to run out to the land right away, and that's a really bad idea because then there's no purpose. We want to develop a purpose before we even enter the woods. That way, when we go to the woods, we're efficient and we're not, and I truly try to stress this, you know, I don't care where Grandpa Mo shot a giant buck 20 years ago. That has nothing to do with the plan for today. It ends up being a just, we're going around looking at this stand, that stand that doesn't relate to the property planning. And what it does is, you know, it's full of stories, waste a lot of time, but it really pulls away from the quality of the plan that will be delivered at the end of the day because we're thinking this, 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 and all of a sudden this gets thrown in from left field, a half hour story about this, or let's go over and look at this stand or something like that. So we're trying to remove the clutter, develop a plan, and then two o'clock in the afternoon, five, whatever time it is, one, we're drawing up a plan. That plan takes hour, hour and a half to draw because we're staring at it, making sure we have everything in our head and then we start to draw it in. We wanna draw it neatly so that it makes sense to the client. And then after we're done drawing that up, whether it's Kevin, Joe, Dylan, or I, we're discussing the plan. I would say the average I discuss a plan with a client is an hour to hour and 15 minutes. We encourage you to record the conversation. By the time we leave, you should have an hour and 15 minutes of, of recorded conversation on your phone, not a video camera, because that recorded conversation, you can actually share, move around. And then at the same time, a lot of clients take notes. And what I found was that about an hour conversation ends up about 20 pages of notes if you actually write it out. If we go back two weeks from now and send you several bullet points for each area or a few sentences, it's gonna equal about five minutes of conversation, 10 minutes. You're getting a lot more by having that recording, taking notes and going back, be able to go back and revisit that conversation. And folks, this has to be drawn up the day of the visit. If we send this to you two weeks later, a week later, it's not any fresher than it should be right now when we actually go out and look at the property. We shouldn't have to send this to you three months from now, six months from now. It's fresh right then. That's when we're discussing it with you. And like I said, that's why we take the time at breakfast to do this. You know, again, people get sick of me saying this, but I've been a well over 1,200 clients at this time. Next year, it'll be 1,300 at some point. And I've, you can imagine the different ways, but right from day one on a client on the east side of 75 near Rudyard, in 2005, my first client, I drew that property up on graph paper with rulers and a pencil. I graduated to colored pencils, then markers, then actually an old Samsung tablet, another Samsung tablet, and then now an iPad Pro. We draw them out. That's just become more clean, efficient, and hopefully delivering a better product to you. A little bit higher megapixels so you can actually um, zoom it out, get a better, bigger picture. But the bottom line is, this is what's worked for clients and what I feel is the best delivery of a product that they can actually start working on the next day. We have a lot of clients, we're going there on a Thursday, they took a long weekend, they want work to do on Friday and they should be able to do it and do it with confidence. And that's why we spend a lot of time talking about in the morning, we look at what's there, we look at, start forming your head. When I go to a property after two hours of conversation, in person with the client, I feel like I'm 50, 60% of the way there. What do you think, Dylan? I mean, you're starting to get a pretty good handle by the time you hit the property. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's more of just kind of checking how everything lays out. And I, my favorite part is when we're out there and actually seeing like the tree that you need to have a stand in, that's yeah. my favorite, so. Yeah, kind of narrow it down. Because again, we, we do this because we love hunting. Yeah, absolutely. And so you want to go out there and see, yeah, if you, we get excited about it. And sometimes a client will say at five o'clock in the afternoon, well, you don't seem as excited about this area. It's not that, it's just that I'm wore out and tired. You're, you're thinking about this the whole time, the whole day. You want to be on point. 
and you're still doing the same thing, but it does wear on you because you're putting a lot into it and you're getting excited about these locations. And so that's why when people talk about, can you do an online consultation? I, it would take hours and hours. We'd have to charge the same amount as a full day and it just doesn't make sense. Usually that takes about five hours. I did that in the past 10 years ago and before. It's not something that uh, we want to take part in. So really after we talk about in the morning, the property, and we look over everything, we interview about the clients about food plots, what they plan in the past, which is kind of we're learning too, because every property you learn something on. Then I tell the clients when we're going on the property, it's a fact finding mission. So we already have this in place. There might be 11 pieces of, of the puzzle with this property from habitat types to edge, and I need to add something on this property to tell you what went on. But we're going out there to see what each piece looks like and how it relates to each other. It's kind of like if, if, there, if there's a 20 acre tag alder swamp on 100 acres, we don't need to see and do a grid pattern through the tag alder swamp. We need to see the edge and how it relates to every other habitat piece on that parcel. I'll add right now, this squiggly line going all the way around the outside of the woods within the hunting zone, not in the access, those are areas where there's a lot of aspen, there's a little bit of oak, and there's some soft maple on that outside edge. After the switchgrass has been planted and added, I want that to be more of a wild zone, increase the edge. And what's cool about this is you can see a lot of this is either southeasterly or southerly, southwest facing. You get lots of sunlight all the way around during the middle of the day to the afternoon. And so once you drop trees that are leaning towards the field into the planted switchgrass, you're dropping them out and perpendicular to the woods because you don't want to create fences for deer where they can't get in and out. This is their area. This is their bedding area. And now we're dropping that out. We're getting hardwood regeneration along that line on the cuttings. Aspen, you're completely cutting, so you get shoots, you get that stump or get that root uh, sprouting, lateral root system sprouting, 7,000 plus shoots per acre. And then you're hinge cutting, smaller maple, maple, and then larger trees, you're just completely cutting and dropping them. So you're getting stump sprouts, you're getting sprouts along the side of a hinge cut, and then you get regeneration on that edge too. The hinge cut trees are those trees in that four inches, three inches, up to six, seven inches in diameter. When we're doing that though, we're creating that hardwood regeneration line. Those trees are going out into the switchgrass. It's creating bedding opportunity around those tops within the switchgrass, you'll get regeneration on those tops when they're hinge cut and they fall into the soil you get actually trees coming up from there but another huge aspect is all those exterior trees along that edge have branches down to the ground what that's doing is it's keeping sunlight from going into the woods so when you cut this line out now you have sun filtering back into the woods 30 40 yards so you're thickening up that entire edge we've all seen where sunlight is piercing through a stand of hardwoods and it grows a bunch of brush and briars and, sh and shrubs in that location that's what you're doing along this entire edge it just becomes a part of that bedding area i hope this makes sense i hope that you can take because not everyone can hire us we don't have room for everybody that wants to hire us unfortunately we're turning away about 2,000 people a year and so that's where dylan he's been going to property since 2016 we added kevin and joe this year they already Joe's schedule, I would say, is about half full for the year. Kevin's is two-thirds full. He's, he's got a lot on his plate. They had goals that they wanted to have before the hunting season begins. And that's when, frankly, we start stopping going to properties. My last trip is in September in Ohio. But then at the same time, clients don't typically want us coming out in October, November, obviously, to work on their land and give a, give a plan. We start again in December, January, somewhere around there. So, Dylan, your schedule's been full since February? Yeah. Sometime? I yeah, I, I've added a couple just here and there, local people. Yeah, local. Yeah, I think Dylan, a lot of times when he films, he's here for a couple days. He actually had a client in Minnesota, so he was at the house, stayed with us last night, which I always refer to Dylan as part of the family. So um, we have dinner together, and we actually went turkey hunting this morning, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we did that last year, too. Uh, we got, a, we got a bird last week and then um, and Dylan went out and I call I called in the bird last week. I called in a bird last year, called my own in to shoot it too, but it's always more of a guarantee when Dylan's in the <laughs> blind with you. Yeah, right. He talked this bird into us from about 200, 250 yards away. Is one I played around with the last two year, days and he didn't want anything to do with me. So I don't know if he's in a different mood, but I'm pretty sure it had to do with Dylan's calling. But uh, had to push a chair aside in the blind, get on my knee, shoot out a different window, open the window up, and um, did need a second shot. And it was 
uh, third shot actually. We got <laughs> got some Is shots. That okay, can I put that footage in here? Because that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can put it in there. <laughs> but uh, but we can say the birds did not last long. I actually found out my heart is still good. That was the most excited I've been in a while. Um, running after that bird, you know, it was a short distance, but we put him out down pretty quick. But um, man, it was a fun hunt and um, made a quick kill on it. And Dylan talked to him in a lot. He was running at us one time. But anyways, Dylan, we do things like that. We're having dinner on the grill tonight, cooking some steaks. And Dylan has a, he had a client yesterday in Minnesota. He has one tomorrow, Western Wisconsin, and I know those are some of the closer ones he's added. And are you going to add any more? I I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to. It's hard to say. It is. It's hard Maybe. to say no. Yeah, it's um, very hard to say no. There's so many years that I've gone into. I'm going to have ten clients a month for ten months, and I end up going to 125. Um, this year I'm at 75, 80, and I don't want to go any more than that. And so I've tried to make changes in the business so I don't have to do that. I really like staying home. Bottom line is we love doing this. We get some time around this. Dylan's been doing this for a long time, Joe, Kevin, and uh, we wish we could go to more. My schedule's been full since sometime in January. Uh, sometime in the middle of summer, we'll start booking for next year. So can't wait to do that. But um, bottom line is we have a lot of experience coming into these plans. Uh, the concepts, I wrote about these in 2012. They're my concepts that I worked on and used for a long time, my own land. And then with clients, like I said, we're continually learning. So the more properties I go to, the more information we can bring to you on YouTube. And I hope it delivers in the plans that we show you. And, um, and again, if you can't hire us, that's okay. We'll keep putting the free content out to try to help you. Um, the web classes, we're working on a new web class this year. Um, it'll be hunting hills and thermals. That'll be out before hunting season. Can't wait to bring that one to you because over 50% of all whitetail hunters have hills and thermals that they need to deal with. And the, the wind direction at that point with hills and thermals has nothing to do with, for the most part, has everything to do and nothing to do with where you should go sit on any given portion because of the thermals in the morning and evening. So I hope that'll help you out when that comes out later before hunting season. And I hope this drawing helps you out today that you there's tactics and concepts that we teach that you can take back to your own property and design it so that you can have a better herd and hunt going into this season. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes so that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.